Well, we've got five uh, sessions in the, in the book of Romans, and my goal is to try and do chapters one to five. And uh, that might be a little bit ambitious, but that's, that's our objective. Uh, we certainly won't be doing, as our brother John Martin did, five sessions on each chapter. Um, so our goal is to try to understand what this book is all about. Uh, just get a broad overview of it. Uh, we hear uh, it said that it is the greatest exposition of the atonement. I believe that's true, but what does that really mean? In this first chapter, and in the next couple of chapters, we have presented before us mankind in their worst state. We see virtually the sludge of the Gentiles, the depths of humanity. And we wonder, how do we get out of that? How does humanity get out of that state and come to God? And the book of the Romans is God's story about how that can be accomplished. Not for everyone, but for those who have a spiritual mind and a desire to do the things of God. So we start with the Apostle himself. It's the work of the Apostle Paul. And there he is, the Apostle Paul. He introduces himself to the Romans in quite a unique way. And we'll just have a quick look at, a quick scan through some of those verses. Uh, we'll be familiar with most of that, but let's go back to Acts chapter 8. Here he is, the Apostle Paul, right at the beginning of um, his involvement with the Ecclesia. It was very negative. We know in verse 1 of Acts, of, uh, Acts chapter 8 that Saul was consenting unto the death of Stephen. He was involved in that. And when Stephen was taken away and buried, we read in verse 3 that as for Saul, he made havoc of the ecclesia, entering into every home and holding men and women, committed them to prison, uh, and in some cases uh, carried out violence uh, and even death was exercised upon some of the early followers of Christ by this man Saul. He was uh, absolutely aggressive in attacking them. But he's, everything was changed in a moment. He had this amazing conversion as we turn the page to Acts chapter 9. And uh, he'd been smitten down on the road to Damascus. And we read in verse 15, But the Lord Jesus said unto him, unto Ananias, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And I'm going to show him how... Great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias did go his way. He entered into the house. He put his hands on Paul and, and said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest has sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. And he received sight forthwith, arose and was baptised. An amazing conversion took place. And Paul, being the sort of man that he was, acted immediately, did not delay. So we read in verse 20 that straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. In verse 22, Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And he spake boldly, verse 29 tells us, in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians, so effectively that they went about to slay him. We know he had to escape from that city. He had on occasion to be restrained by the brethren. So in Acts chapter 17, in the course of his second journey, uh, we read in verse 10, after there had been trouble in the city, that the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who went into the synagogue of the Jews. And then... Further issues in verse 14, immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were by sea. They had to restrain him, they had to send him on his way, they had to get him out of these difficult circumstances because he was such a, just a driven man, so purposeful, so committed that he would go on in the face of the worst of situations. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, here's the apostle, we know these words, and uh, this is the man who is writing this epistle to the Romans. Uh, in verse 23, he says this, this is his 
situation. In labour is more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times he received 40 stripes, save one. He was beaten with rods, he was stoned, he was shipwrecked. In journeyings often, in verse 26, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in the city, in the wilderness, in the sea, and amongst false brethren. All of these things he endured. This man who was just absolutely driven to present the gospel, having understood how far away he'd been from the things of God in his former state, now he's just totally committed. And he's going to write to the, to the uh, Romans. He'd never been there. We, we would have noticed that perhaps in Romans chapter 1 as we read it together. So in verse 10, he says, making a request, this is chapter 1, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Because I long to see you that I, I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that ye may be established. Well, he wanted to have a prosperous journey to get to Rome. We know how he got to Rome. It was by no means what we'd call a prosperous journey. He went in chains. He was shipwrecked. Dragged from pillar to post until finally he got to Rome and then he's in prison. So it was something less than a prosperous journey. But he wanted to go and see them. In verse 13, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let or prevented that I might have some fruit among you. And uh, he wanted to get to Rome and to do that. Romans was a mixed Jewish and Gentile ecclesia. As you read through the epistle, you'll see instances where clearly he's addressing his remarks mainly to Romans or Gentiles and sometimes when he addresses principally to the Jews. It's placed deliberately, I think, to, at the beginning of all of the epistles of the Apostle Paul. And the reason, I think, is to provide a doctrinal underpinning to all of the other epistles. And we read them as we proceed consecutively through the record. Romans gives us that basis. And it was written, I believe, from Corinth during Paul's third missionary journey. We want to spend a few minutes just looking at that. There's his third missionary journey. And uh, he got to Corinth towards the end of that, or towards the end of uh, his journey, and then he had to travel from Corinth back to Jerusalem, and he, and he had a clear intention for doing that, and he had a timeline that he needed to meet. So it was, I believe, in Corinth, in a period when he was there for three months, that he wrote the epistle to the Romans. And here is the detail behind that. I don't want to just run through that because it's interesting. It just gives us an anchor and a perspective. We can see where he was, what he was doing, what his objectives were, and it's always good to have that in the back of our mind as we read an epistle. In Romans, towards the end of the book, in Romans chapter 16, not towards the end, it's right at the end. Romans 16, and at verse 23, he says, Gaius, mine host, and of the whole ecclesia, saluteth you, and Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, salutes you, and Quartus, a brother. Gaius is his host. Who was Gaius? Well, we turn the page in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and at verse 14 the apostle says to the Corinthians I thank God that I baptised none of you but Crispus and Gaius so Gaius was of the Corinthian ecclesia he mentions Erastus uh, there in verse 23 of Romans 16 who was also of the Corinthian ecclesia Acts chapter 19 and verse 22 tells us that at the beginning of chapter 16, as he commences all of the wonderful um, notices that he sends to all of his brothers and sisters and friends in Rome, he knew many of them. He'd never been there, but he knew many. He says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the, of the uh, ecclesia, which is at Sancria. And if we remember that uh, little map, there's Corinth and a few kilometres from Corinth. Uh, on the isthmus, there was Sencria, a port city or a port town. And Phoebe was from there. 
And it seems from the note in chapter 16, verse 1, as he commends her to the Romans, that she's travelled there and most likely she's bearing the epistle in her hands. Paul, we believe, is in Corinth. If we go to Acts chapter 20, here's the context. So we read in Acts chapter 20 and verse 2, when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece and there abode three months. This was Corinth. He stayed there for three months in verse 3. Uh, in the spring, most commentators say, of AD 57, and it was the latter part of the third journey. He's waiting for better sailing weather. The winter is just behind him. Uh, they're heading into spring. The weather's getting better. The Mediterranean will be navigable soon. And he's just waiting for an opportunity to get on a boat and head off. He wants to go to Jerusalem with funds for the poor saints there. So in Acts 19 verse 21, he talks about that. After these things were, were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. In the end, he did, of course. So his intent is to go to Jerusalem with the funds for the poor saints. And if we go back to Romans, chapter 15, he talks about that as well in chapter 15, from verse 25. Now I go to Jerusalem, he says in verse 25 of Romans 15, to minister unto the saints, for it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. That's his intent. He's already talked about those plans to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 16. And he's hasting because of the weather, because of the, the seasons. There was limited travel in the Mediterranean until the weather settled down. So in Acts 20, and at verse 16, he says this. Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia for he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. So he's just got this short period in Corinth, AD 57, in the spring. The weather's gradually improving. He's heading off to Jerusalem. He wants to take the funds there for the poor saints, meet his commitments that he'd made to those of Macedonia and Achaia and the regions of Corinth, take that money back there, and then his plan is to go to Rome and then on to Spain. Those were his plans. So he's got that little window of opportunity where he's in Corinth, three months, and there we believe is where he wrote the epistle. Well, in broad outline, what's the epistle all about? And we won't go to all of these verses, we'll just have a run through it and we'll look at chapter one tonight and then hopefully over the next few nights, God willing, we'll be able to see the main features of the atonement, the main features of the teaching concerning the righteousness of God as the solution to the problems that the world has got. So we have the introduction in chapter 1 to verse 15, and then that, those wonderful verses, verse 16 and 17, the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel for the salvation of men. That's the principle. And in the next few chapters, particularly in chapter 3, 4 and 5, he expands upon that and illustrates those principles. So from chapter 1, verse 18, the third section, to chapter 11, verse 36, the demonstration of God's righteousness. Firstly, man's failure to attain righteousness. 1, verse 18 to 3, verse 20. If we've been listening, had our ears open as this chapter was read for us, the last verses from verse 18 onwards, that's just a horror story. That just tells us the depths of humanity. That just tells us how far people can go when they deny God and set aside his teaching. So men failed. Yes, they did. The Gentiles first, or first mentioned, and then lest the Jews might say, well, we're not like that. We're not like those Gentiles. We're a better class of people. 
Paul then picks on them and says, well, you and I better, really. You failed as well. And all men have failed to attain to righteousness. So we have that beautiful section from chapter 3 to chapter 5 where the righteousness of God mentioned in verse 16 and 17 in this chapter is expounded in more detail. And then, having done that, we have these sections where number three, the righteousness of Righteousness of God outworked in the believer's life of holiness. So chapter 6 we know is about baptism and so on. Then the Jew might say, well, what about us? We're God's chosen people, a royal priesthood. What, what's, what's our position? So he outlines the principles of the righteousness of God in relation to Israel themselves. And then he talks about practical responsibilities, personal greetings and then comes to a conclusion. So that, in very broad terms, is the book of Romans. Here's where mankind is, in absolute degradation. And even if the Jews weren't in the degradation of the Greeks, they were still far from God in their mind and in the, in the way they thought. They needed recovery. What's the process, of the process of that? Well, through the power of God unto salvation. And the understanding and application of the righteousness of God revealed in that gospel to believers and the complete submission of mankind to that and then the outworking of that in life. That's in broad terms what this book is all about. So chapter 1, well we've read it together. Paul called and separated to the gospel, the first seven verses. His care for the Roman ecclesia, his desire to visit them from verses 8 to 15. The theme, the thesis of, chapter, of, of the, the whole book really, verses 16 and 17. The righteousness of God revealed in the gospel for man's salvation. Needed because men have failed. And firstly the failure of the Gentiles who ignore the evidence of God's existence and power and lived according to a terrible pattern. And then in those last few verses from verse 21 to verse 32 the appalling evil of mankind particularly amongst the Gentiles. That's what we're faced with in this first chapter of the book of Romans. He introduces himself in verse 1 in a particular way. And verse 1, his introduction is quite unique. And rather than flounder around and flick back and forth and look at all these introductions, here's the 13 epistles of the Apostle Paul where he introduces himself by name to the recipients of those epistles. Then there was Hebrews, which I believe was written by Paul, but that's written anonymously. There's no introduction of himself. And we've highlighted the ways in which, in Romans chapter 1, there's a, a uniqueness about that. Paul, a servant or a bond slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. Those expressions are not exclusive but almost unique in the way he presents himself in the introduction to each of the epistles. I don't want to go through those line by line now. He's, he calls himself called to be an apostle or as it literally is a called apostle and he has a similar expression in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 1 and nothing like it in all the rest of the introductions. He calls himself a bond slave of Jesus Christ. He says he's separated to the gospel of God. Those expressions are not anywhere except in Romans chapter 1. He's very carefully setting himself before the brethren and sisters of the Roman ecclesias. So let's have a look firstly at that introduction. As he introduces himself, he's writing a letter. He knows a lot of the members. Many he doesn't know. and He's certainly never been there and he'd love to meet them. He needs to present himself to them. He's got a task in front of him to present this treatise, as Brother John Carter calls it. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, uh, the word servant is doulos, a bond slave. He is, in fact, the apostle, a free-born Roman citizen. And sometimes in the course of his gospel work and his missionary journeys, he deliberately took advantage of his Roman citizenship and laid claim to that publicly so that the work of the gospel could proceed without impediment in some cases. Not often, but two or three times he does that. 
he loved that relationship with his Lord. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Here's how Paul felt about all that. In verse 22 of 1 Corinthians 7, he says, He that is called in the Lord, being a servant, a slave, is the Lord's free man. Likewise also he that is called being free, that's himself, is Christ's servant or slave. You're bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Not in the sense that you're a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was Paul's position. He's a freeborn Roman citizen, a powerful position in the Roman Empire at that time, but he gloried in the fact that he was a servant, a bond slave of Jesus Christ. He's a called apostle. The record says in the AV, called to be an apostle, it literally means a called apostle. And that was an important situation for him. But look what he says about them in verse 6. Among whom are you, the Romans, also the called of Jesus Christ. You're in a wonderful position, position too. In verse 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called saints. So he's a called apostle. That's a very honoured status. And he talks about how he wants to bestow, bestow benefits upon the ecclesia in a little while, which will spring from that status that he's got. But you also, you Romans, you're the called of Jesus Christ. You're called saints. That's a wonderful position to be in. He is separated unto the gospel of God. In Galatians chapter 1, he speaks of how he was so separated. Maybe we'll remember this little verse as well. Galatians 1 verse 15 he says, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. He was separated from his mother's womb. Paul later found out and realised. For 30 years he had no idea that that was the case. He went on a different course altogether. Hunted down Christians. Put them in prison. Had them beaten. Some of them were killed. He did that. When he went to collect money for the poor saints at Jerusalem, some of those people at Jerusalem were poor saints because of him, because of what he had done in destroying families, in leaving widows and children without a father in the home. That was his fault on some, to some degree. That, just, that sort of helps us to understand the passion that he had to help out because of what he'd done. He was separated from his mother's womb, the record says, God called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, among the nations. God had a purpose for me that I never understood and didn't have any idea about. For 30 plus years of his life, he had no idea of the truth of what he just said to the Galatians. That's a striking thing. God knew me in the womb and he called me and separated me for that work and I had no idea. Sometimes I wonder if we've got any real idea of where we're going and what we're doing in life. What our mission of service is in the ecclesia, in the brotherhood. Perhaps God has had work for us to do and we're just fighting against it. As the Lord said to Paul, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. You're just against everything that we've been trying to do with you, Paul. And we've had to throw you down on the ground and blind you to, to, wake, to wake you up to the purpose of God in him. So let's be thoughtful about what our work is in the ecclesia. In Acts chapter 13, at the time when the first missionary journey had its commencement, there's a similar, a similar thought is involved here. So in Acts chapter 13, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, verse 2, the Holy Spirit said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. They sent them away, being sent forth by the Holy Spirit and their, their job was outlined in verse 5. They preached the word of God. That was their purpose. That was his ministry. 
that he was separated to the gospel of God. Acts 26, just a couple of pages back from Romans chapter 1. Again, the apostle understood that. When Jesus spoke to him and said in verse 16, Rise, Saul, as he was then, stand upon thy feet. I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which you have seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto you. I've got some work for you, Paul, and I've got a lot of, lot of stuff to tell you. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. And that was the first thing that had to happen to Paul. His eyes had to be opened and he had to be turned from darkness to light. Now that's your job, Paul. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance, etc. And he says, I, wasn't, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. He realised immediately how wrong he'd been in every aspect of his life. But he turned it around. So there's the apostle as he introduces himself to them. And his work is, he's separated to the gospel of God. Which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Jesus was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. So we've got that word made and flesh in Romans 1 verse 3. In John chapter 1 and verse 14 we have the word was made flesh those are the only two verses those words are common but they're only two verses where those words occur in that sort of juxtaposition so it seems that he's making an allusion to that and so in Romans 1 verses 3 and 4 he picks up the sense concerning Christ made of the seed of David according to the flesh of human origin and declared to be the son of God with power according to a spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So he's declared to be the son of God. Declared is the Greek word horizo, from which we get the word horizon. It means to mark out a boundary, to determine, to constitute, to appoint someone to a, to a position. And Jesus was ordained by God, same word, declared, he was appointed by God to be the judge. Um, in Acts 17, verse 31. We read the apostle in Athens and he makes this point. He has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, marked out, appointed, declared, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in, in that he has raised him from the dead. So he is ordained and appointed as son of God in three aspects in particular. With power, according to a spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, in those three particulars. With power, will he have the spirit without measure? John 3.34 says that God gave him not the spirit God gave not the spirit by measure unto him. In other words, he didn't parcel it out, didn't give him a little bit of the spirit. He had the total, complete access to the spirit of God. It was that spirit which enabled him to perform the miracles. I won't look these verses up, otherwise we'll run out of time very quickly. And he called on people to believe me for the very work's sake. So power, divine power in Christ attested to Jesus of as God's son and it's always God's power acting through Jesus a spirit of holiness according to a spirit of holiness now 1 Corinthians 4.21 says this what will you shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness Galatians 6 verse 1 says much the same. Spirit is used in relation to aspects of character. So Jesus is marked out as the Son of God by the character of holiness that he manifested. His sinlessness was derived from his divine parentage. We won't look up those chapters in Isaiah, 
but we will look up John, John chapter 8. Let's have a quick look at that. So in John 8 verse 29 he says, he that, had, he that sent me is with me, for the Father hath not left me alone, I do always those things that please him. Always. He did. And in verse 46 he said to those who were having a go at him, which of you convinceth me of sin? Nobody could. And they tried, no doubt. So there he was, a spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. Well, others rose from the dead by the hands of prophets or of Jesus himself. But Christ rose by special divine power to die no more and became therefore the first fruits of them that sleep. His sinlessness demanded the resurrection. We go back to Acts chapter 2 and the words of Peter at Pentecost. That's what Peter tells us. And it took Peter a while to figure this all out. But Acts chapter 2 and a verse 24, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Because of his sinless life. Verse 27, thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy unholy one to see corruption. Verse 32, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received the, of, the Holy, of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear, for David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, Yahweh said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand. So there is the Lord Jesus Christ, confirmed in his position by those three aspects. Son of God with power, according to a spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. By whom we've received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. And he goes on in that next section from verses 8 to 15, which we'll skim through very quickly. And you can just follow those verses as you see those comments before you. He says, first I thank my God. That was Paul. God was always first. Then other matters. And their faith, he says, is notorious. Your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Everyone's talking about the faith of these people. His prayers for them, verse 9, were ongoing, without ceasing. I make mention of you always in my prayers. Now, there are lessons here for us, brethren and sisters, in relation to, to our prayers. Who do we pray for? How often do we do that? Do we have a schedule? Do we think about who needs prayer? And what we should say. The apostle just did it naturally always about the Romans and others as well. He wants to get to them. Those prayers included his petition that he might, God willing, be able to visit them. Verse 10. Uh, he wanted to bless them by virtue of his apostleship in verse 11. I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that ye might be established. Now, that might seem a little bit vague. What's he really saying? I think he's saying, well, I'm an apostle. When I get there, I'll be able to review the situation within the ecclesia and see how the imparting of spirit gifts for some might be able to enhance the worship and work of the ecclesia. I think that's probably what it's saying. That I might be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. It wasn't all one-sided. He wasn't the great apostle sort of laying down the law for them. He expected that there would be mutual benefit in that visit. His plans to visit had been frustrated, verse, uh, verse 13. Uh, yet he says, I'm dead both to the Greeks and the barbarians, the wise and the unwise. I learned from every situation in life and all of those circumstances have helped me. So as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. And now we come to these two verses, verses 16 and 17. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. That's an important expression. Paul says, well, 
The gospel of Christ is my work. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm involved in it every day. The Lord Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 8 and in the parallel passage in Luke says effectively if we are ashamed of him then when he comes he'll be ashamed of us. I think we need to lift our game. I certainly do. In working in the gospel of Christ, in our preaching work, in all those aspects. That was the Apostle Paul. He says in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 16, Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. That was his task given to him by the Lord Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. There's that word dunamis that we saw in verse 4. Declared to be the Son of God with power. Same word here in verse 16. This good news message about Jesus Christ and him crucified was for those of the right spirit a mighty power which would bring salvation. We've just got a note at the bottom there, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ and most commentators say, including Ellicott, these words are wanting in the oldest manuscripts and should be omit, uh, omitted. Yet certainly the gospel was the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. Everyone means exactly that. The word simply means any, everyone, whatsoever, whosoever. It's the word that we have in John chapter 3 from the Lord Jesus Christ. Whosoever believeth in me should not perish but have everlasting life. It's the expression of full inclusion. Gentile and Jew, all involved. But it's to the Jew first. The Jew was first by virtue of their history. It was necessary, said uh, the record in Acts 13 verse 46, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. And seeing you put it from you and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And it was the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes. Firstly, though, to the Jew, and then to the Greek. For therein, that is in that gospel, which is the power of God to salvation, therein is the righteousness of God revealed. And that word righteousness, we just need to bear it in mind. Dikaiosuni. It means simply what it says. It really means just righteousness. Strong says equity of character or act, specifically Christian justification, and it's translated exclusively by that term righteousness. It occurs 36 times in Romans, and it's always translated righteousness. And in all the New Testament books, the next highest usage in any book is seven times. 36 times. What's the epistle to the Romans about when we've got that sort of record? It's about righteousness. How we achieve it. How God means to bring that about in our lives. How he's going to get us out of this sludge of humanity and bring us back to him. The principle is through righteousness imputed to us because of our faith in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. It's one of a family of related words which are used in, in uh, Romans. Um, we have this word in Romans chapter 2, and it's virtually just on the same page, in verse 5. After thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Decay o Christia. Chrysis, Chrysia or Chrysis is the word for judgment and added to that is the word for righteous, righteous judgment. Dikaios, just, sometimes translated just and sometimes translated righteous. It's used here in verse 17. The just shall live by faith and six other times in Romans. Dikaiou, justified, used 15 times in Romans. Mostly in chapters 3, 4 and 5 the chapters where the exposition of the righteousness of God is based. Uh, Dikaioma, judgment, righteousness, etc. is used five times in Romans and the first time it's used is in Romans 1 verse 32, right at the end of the chapter. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same but have pleasure in them that do them. And the word for Justification is used twice only in the New Testament and they're both in Romans. 
and hopefully we'll get to those in due time. The righteousness of God, there in, in uh, verse 17, there is the righteousness of God revealed. We never find an expression in scripture, the righteousness of man. We have the righteousness of God, we have righteousness, never is there the righteousness of man. On the contrary, there is none righteous, says the Apostle in Romans 3 verse 10. No, not one. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20 talks about that principle as well. So God alone possesses righteousness as an intrinsic characteristic of himself. So the righteousness of God in the Gospels is revealed. The word is apocalypto. There's an apocalypse, a revelation of the righteousness of God. And in the next verse, verse 18, interestingly enough, the wrath of God is revealed, exactly the same word. There's a revelation, an apocalypsis of the wrath of God, which will be manifest. The very first time, let's go back here, Matthew chapter 3. This is the very first time that the term righteousness is used in the New Testament. And it's used by the Lord Jesus Christ. We read in verse 13 that Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan under John with a specific intent in mind. He's on his way to be baptised. He's got that fixed in his mind. So he's walking 80 miles to go from Galilee, from Nazareth to Jordan. And when he gets to John and says, I want to be baptised, John forbade him, saying, I need to be baptised of thee. This is the baptism of repentance for sin. You have none. Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfil all righteousness. And of course the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled righteousness in his life in every particular. We don't do that. Yet God imputes righteousness to us because of our faith in him. He could fulfil it actually, others including us by imputation. Here's what John Carter says about this theme in Romans 1, verse 16 and 17, in his letter to the Romans. And it's not a complete quote, but this is what he says. What gives the gospel this power for salvation? This is a problem almost as old as the race. How can sinful man attain to a state of reconciliation with a righteous God? It's insoluble by man, but it has been wonderfully solved by divine wisdom. Sin had caused a breach between God and man. That breach is evident in this chapter, Romans chapter 1, and we read about it. Continued on. Paul says that in the gospel is revealed the righteousness of God. This simply means the character of God is righteous. A further meaning is included in the words, and he goes on through the rest of the book to expound upon that. Thus we read in Philippians chapter 3 verse 9 that Paul's desire was to win Christ and be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ the righteousness which is of God by faith. Here is God's solution to man's insoluble problem. I want to win Christ. I want to be found in him. I know I don't have any righteousness of my own. But there is a righteousness that is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. This righteousness is one which has its source in God, which is available for man upon the exercise of faith. I don't know that I could put that any better. John Carter writes beautifully about that subject. So he says, it is the power of God to salvation. Therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. And we look at the prepositions which he used there, the Greek terms that he used, ek, out of faith, ice, unto or toward faith. So this righteousness of God is revealed, manifested, apocalypsed, from faith, or depending on faith as Weymouth translates it, intending to produce faith. It's a process. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. 
men can only be described as just or righteous if they live or act upon their faith or belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we get, we hope, to chapters 3 to 5, we'll talk about that a lot more. The failure of the Gentiles, and it was a disgraceful failure, appalling, the record that we read in the ensuing verses. And so there's just the summary of it. The evidence of God's existence and power from verses 18 to 20 and then the appalling evil of mankind for the rest of the, of the verses. The righteousness of God had been revealed or apocalypsed to those who live by faith. Now the wrath of God is revealed or apocalypsed to those who choose ungodliness and unrighteousness in their way of life. They are in fact so hostile they suppress the truth by their unrighteousness. The end of verse 18. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Hold means to hold down, to suppress it, to keep it under. So they suppress the truth by their unrighteousness. This is a conscious, deliberate act and behaviour. So he goes on in verse 20 to say, The invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. These people who hold the truth down in unrighteousness, who've turned aside from the things of God, they don't have a leg to stand on. As soon as they open their eyes and look around, they see the evidence of deity, the creation of the world, clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. And the world has turned aside from that. Net Bible translates that this way. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, dynamis, there's that term again, and divine nature or Godhead have been clearly seen because they are understood through what has been made. So people are without excuse. So all the people today who believe or say they believe in evolution, Paul says you don't have an excuse. You have the evidence of creation all around and there's no excuse at all. So there's some of the amazing things created. Just impossible to produce by any means other than specific creation. Verse 21. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. They became futile in their thoughts and they're senseless. The word means unintelligent, lacking discernment. Their hearts were darkened. And professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Ellicott says they were made fools. And what he means is God confirmed them in what they chose. That's what he's, he's meaning. Darkness and folly were their choices and God confirmed them in that. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God. Well, it's interesting this expression change in verse 23. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible beasts, to birds, to four-footed beasts and creeping things. They made a change in their hearts and their minds. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 and 52 says, we're going to be all changed, and it's the same word. Changed in a moment, in the twinkle of an eye. But they had their own change. In verse 25, the record says, uh, they changed the truth of God into a lie. There's that word again. In verse 26, we have that word again. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change that which was according to nature to that which was against. And the expression change means they exchanged one for the other. They exchanged truth for a lie. They changed nature to unnatural. They made those changes. And once the reality of God is changed, the reality of human society is changed. So they say, in effect, let's change uh, the truth of God into a lie, and they worshipped and served the creature more than the creator. Uh, they changed the principles of God 
into an image, verse 23 tells us. It's the Greek word icon, and in the English we have icon. We know what that means. They ended up worshipping idols. Um, I don't know that I'll worry about reading that. Just again, John Carter talks about the underlying rottenness of first century Rome. A sink of rottenness, he calls it. Family life was unspeakable. Slaves were wretched. They corrupted the children. The Roman boys at the end there says say that they grew old and jaded and rotten with vice before they were out of their teens. A terrible, disgraceful situation. And because of that, the record tells us we've got these three expressions. Verse 24, verse 26, and verse 28. See that? God also gave them up to uncleanness. Verse 26, God gave them up to vile affections. Verse 28, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. It's the same word in every case. And what it's really saying to us, brothers and sisters, is that God abandoned them to the life that they wanted to live. In the book of Romans, that term gave them up or delivered is used six times. The three times that we looked at here, verse 24, 26, 28, and then later in the, in the book, we have these, these expressions used in a much more positive sense. Verse four, chapter 4, verse 25, who was delivered for our offences, same word. Chapter 6, verse 17, you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine into which you were delivered. In chapter 8, verse 32, God delivered him up for us all, his own son. So isn't that an amazing contrast between those who were given up, abandoned by God to sin, and how God gives us over to those wonderful circumstances. Uh, Bauer, in relation to verse 24, says he abandoned them to impurity. And in verse 26, he abandoned them to disgraceful passions. So the context determines the sense. He gave them up or abandoned them to what they chose, how they chose to live. He delivers us up to the life in Christ and delivered his own son for our salvation. Just some beautiful expressions there. And from verse 28... The Apostle widens this up. I'm not going to go into the, into the detail of those few verses from verse 24. We know what that means. In fact, in the previous uh, slide, I'll just put there the contrast. Pride month, in a whole month, a parade's not enough. It's got to be a whole month of pride in absolute evil. And then the contrast of us being delivered to obey from the heart the doctrine into which we are, in, uh, are involved, the gospel of his son. There's the contrast. It's pretty stark, isn't it? And then verse 28 widens up to include all people. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now, he's not talking about the sexual depravity of the previous verses. He's saying once we get to that, we go beyond that, and there's a widespread generally diffused uh, rejection of the things of God. Weymouth says so it was to utterly worthless minds that God gave them up for them to do things which should not be done. And so we then have this list of terrible evils from verse uh, 29 onwards. The ESV puts it this way. You can follow in the AV, I'll just read it. And follow it through. Over 20 terrible evils. This is where man ends when he rejects God and when God abandons them to the evil that they've chosen. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips. Slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent new ways of sinning. They disobey their parents. They are foolish, faithless, covenant breakers heartless and ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. 
They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. That's the ESV translation of those awful verses. So, as we look at those verses, brothers and sisters, we see some things there which are horrifying, but we also see some things which are quite challenging. You know, if we are involved in the righteousness of God, it's the power of God to salvation for us. We have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and in the outworking of the gospel in him. And yet here are some things which, as we read through that awful list, there are some things which maybe sometimes we're involved in. Covetousness, envy, strife, deceit, gossips. Insolent, arrogant, boastful, maybe. Foolish. So we can't just say we're not there. That this is a picture of the evils of the Gentiles in first century Rome. And we're not there. We're there all right, brothers and sisters, so we need the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need the apocalypse of the righteousness of God, an understanding of that and a commitment to it, that we might live our lives faithfully before our loving Heavenly Father. So let's think about those things as we prepare to consider Romans chapter 2 next time, God willing.